Hey there, What Next TBD listeners. Before we start the show, I want to let you know about a story coming up a little later. It's from one of our partners, SAP. AI comes at you fast. If you don't get reliable and relevant advice, your business might miss out. Whether you're looking to automate tasks or embed AI in your business processes, SAP can help. To learn more, head to sap.com slash AI. And stick around for expert advice on how to embrace AI with confidence. Apple Card is the perfect cash back rewards credit card. You earn up to 3% daily cash on every purchase every day. Visit apple.co slash card calculator to see how much you can earn. Apple Card issued by Goldman Sachs Bank USA Salt Lake City Branch. Subject to credit approval. Terms apply. If your employer sends you an email telling you to, quote, get that money, you probably work in sales, right? Maybe you're a real estate agent. But what if I told you I'm talking about an email that went out to doctors? NBC News financial reporter Gretchen Morganson heard about this a few years ago. My background is on Wall Street, and this all sounded very familiar to me, you know, about encouraging people to make sales, you know, to to make a quota, you know, at the end of the month or something. That's a very Wall Street thing to do. The email was shared with Gretchen by a dermatologist in Michigan named Allison Brown. Dr. Brown's office had recently been bought out by a private equity firm, and the firm was pushing doctors to book more patients to meet budget goals, offering up bonuses if they succeeded. The effort to juice sales was part of a larger shift in care that Dr. Brown noticed once private equity took over. She had had to see so many more patients every day, and she didn't have the adequate support staff to see those patients. She also described cases of patients seen multiple times for a problem that could have been resolved in a single visit. Now, that, of course, raises those patients' costs. But this isn't just happening in Dr. Brown's former office in Michigan, or just in dermatology. Around the country, private equity is buying up doctors' offices, clinics, and hospitals, hoping to turn a profit in an industry where the stakes are literally life or death. My reporting has found that 40% of emergency departments in hospitals are run by private equity staffing companies. 11% of nursing homes are owned by private equity. And that is probably a low number because there are sort of hidden ownership of nursing homes, the way they're structured. 9% of anesthesiologists are owned by private equity. 8% of hospitals across the country are owned by private equity. So it has been a full-on assault of the industry. And what what worries you about this? Just the way you're talking right now, it makes me think, oh, I should be very afraid. I should be very worried about this, about these numbers and about private equity um, taking over all these medical practices. Why? There are a couple of reasons, Emily. One is that patient costs go up. But the most important aspect of it is the care that these patients receive. If your first interest is profits, if your primary interest is profits, your primary interest is not patient care. It's in generating higher revenues from the business of patient care. And so that is really the crux of the problem. So today on the show... Private equity has a prescription for the future of healthcare, and it has some gnarly side effects. I'm Emily Peck, filling in for Lizzie O'Leary, and you're listening to What Next TBD, a show about tech, power, and how the future will be determined. Stick around. Apple Card is the perfect cash back rewards credit card. You earn up to 3% daily cash on every purchase every day. 
That's 3% on your favorite products at Apple, 2% on all other Apple Card with Apple Pay purchases, and 1% on anything you buy with your titanium Apple Card or virtual card number. Visit apple.co slash card calculator to see how much you can earn. Apple Card issued by Goldman Sachs Bank, USA, Salt Lake City branch. Subject to credit approval. Terms apply. This podcast is brought to you by Slate Studios and SAP. AI is moving so fast. If you don't get reliable and relevant advice, your business might miss out. Welcome to Dear Artie, an advice column from SAP, where we tackle the tricky questions at the intersection of AI and business. Here's our expert, the technology futurist, Ian Kahn. Hi, I'm excited to dive into today's question. Dear Artie, the supply chain has been a friend and foe to my company. Can AI make us more resilient? Signed, Supply Chain to Uncertainty. Hey, Supply. Here's how AI in the supply chain can help. AI can massively automate data analytics and understand the movement of your goods. AI can point out weak links, market demand trends, optimal logistics, and other important aspects that impact the top and bottom lines for the business. Take the example of a large grocery chain that has hundreds of vendors spread through the country. In some cases, you may need to reroute shipments to other stores, such as in the case of fresh produce, a good that can go bad very fast. Managing such a supply chain is heavily dependent on the data provided, and AI can help optimize this information so that your supply chain works at its optimal levels. Embrace AI with confidence. Head to sap.com slash AI to learn more. Private equity is one of those finance terms that people recognize but might not totally understand. It's a shorthand way of referring to private businesses that buy other companies with a goal of improving their financials by cutting costs and increasing efficiency. The firm's ultimate goal is to sell the company in question or take it public for more money than it initially spent. In some cases, like healthcare, a PE firm will buy up a bunch of businesses of one type so it can share resources, like say, buy 20 individual dentist offices and cluster them all in one system to manage like billing, scheduling, and insurance. So it's not like it's, you know, fancy. There's nothing sort of, <laughs> you know, unique about it. It's just companies that take over other companies, use a lot of debt to do so, and then want to sell those companies within five to seven years at a profit. When did private equity first start getting involved in healthcare? It started getting involved in like 2005 and 2006, that area. Mm-hmm. And that is because healthcare is 18% of gross domestic product in this country. And that is a huge money tap that these people and these companies can uh, tap into. So what do the private equity firms say their goal is here? I mean, I know their goal is turning a profit, but what pitch are they making when they're looking to acquire, you know, healthcare companies or practices? Well, they will say that they're making these operations more efficient. That's their biggest claim. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there is inefficiency in healthcare, of course. We see it uh, ourselves when we go to the hospital. Um, So it makes sense. It's kind of tracks. You say to yourself, okay, yeah, there's probably a lot of fat that could be cut. And then maybe this operation could be more, you know, lean and more efficient. But what they don't say is that making it more lean and more efficient generally means firing workers who are the very reason that health ca- good health care happens. Okay, there is a direct correlation between staffing in a hospital and good patient outcomes. But if you've got to cut costs because you're carrying a heavy debt load, your first cost, your biggest cost is your employment, your employees, your payroll. Mm-hmm. And so those people get cut and the patients end up suffering. Another thing they do to cut costs isn't merely they cut staff. They bring in 
I believe you call them physician extenders, like nurse practitioners and physician assistants to do the work that you would expect doctors to do. And that causes problems as well, right? Absolutely. So when a private equity firm buys a physician practice, they do a couple of things pretty quickly. One is they schedule more patient visits, dramatically more. They hire what's called physician extenders. These are non-doctors to do more of the uh, work, to see the patients, to do more of the um, clinical work. Um, They're lower cost employees. So that's crucial. That's why they do so. And then you're going to also see, according to the research, increased numbers of tests given to patients, which increases their costs. In fact, in, in dermatology, going back to Dr. Brown, there was actually a 2018 Journal of the American Medical Association research that examined 33,000 skin cancer screenings among Mm -hmm. 20,000 patients. And it found that physician extenders had failed to identify cancers significantly more often than doctors did. But the extenders also ordered more biopsies, which generate increased fees for patients. So yeah, there is, uh, there are other things that they do. I know that Dr. Brown also told me that the quality of the instruments that they were supposed to use in the clinic declined after the private equity owner came in. So, you know, it's cutting corners wherever you can. It can be hard to prove that a specific situation or issue at a doctor's office or hospital was directly caused by a private equity acquisition, but studies have shown that cutting those corners can have a real detrimental effect on patients. One of the most shocking and frightening academic studies that has come out recently on private equity in healthcare was done by academics at the University of Chicago, NYU, and UPenn. And it Mm -hmm. studied nursing homes owned by private equity over a long period, 14 years. And what they found was that there were 10% more deaths at nursing homes run by private equity than at nursing homes not run by private equity. 10% more mortality, which translated over that time to 20,000 lives. So I spoke with the, one of the academics who'd done the work. I said, well, so what did you determine was the reason for this 10% greater mortality rate? And she said, lack of staffing. It's that simple. And so when you have a business model that requires you to cut costs in healthcare, it doesn't work. Not for the patient anyway. You know, there was just a couple of weeks ago, Harvard and I think the University of Chicago put out a study about what happens at hospitals that are owned by private equity. They found that after the acquisition, um, uh, they found a spike in patient falls, a spike in patient infections. So, I mean, you're talking about patient care. You're talking about health. You're talking about life and death here. It's really scary. I recently um, had an orthopedist appointment at a new, a new practice. And I went there and it was, it was very efficient to get a, an appointment and all this. And I went in with a problem in my hip. And I wasn't seen by a doctor at all. I came in, they sent me right to x-ray without talking to anyone to take the x-ray. And then after that, I spoke to a physician assistant, no doctor. She made a diagnosis. I followed up with a physical therapist. He said, I really think this diagnosis is wrong. And, you know, he explained why. And, you know, x-rays can show a lot of things that aren't actually a problem. They just show up on scans. And, you know, you need a better diagnosis to figure things out. And so as I'm preparing to talk to you, you know, I look up the practice and what do you know? <laughs> it's affiliated with private equity firms. Oh my so. gosh, look at you. <laughs> You're being an exe- investigative reporter. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but it was just, it really brought home for me, you know, the whole experience was so bizarre and it felt kind of factory-like. I wonder if that's the experience of other, you know, patients. And, and I wonder what doctors think about that. 
Well, doctors are extremely upset about it because they are being asked, required to do things that they would not otherwise want to do. And there was a case where in an emergency department in an HCA hospital, this emergency department physician was working in this medical center and they had a code blue policy that was troubling to him. The code blue policy in the hospital required that whomever was the emergency department physician on duty would have to also be available for code blues elsewhere in the hospital. Now, a code blue is when there's a life-threatening situation mm -hmm. in a patient and you need you know, immediate attention. So this doctor, his name was Ray Bravant, he raised his hand and he said, look, the rule says I have to be here in the emergency department ready to respond to a code blue here all the time, 24 seven. I can't also go to the pediatric ward or the oncology ward or whatever to respond to a code. Blue. I can't be in two places at once. And so he raised his hand. He got all of his fellow physicians to sign on. They, we wanted this changed. We want this changed. He was working for a private equity-backed staffing company. And they didn't like the fact that he was making noise. And he kept making noise. And finally, they fired him. Mm -hmm. And not only did they fire him, they barred him from working for any other hospital in the region that was also staffed by the private equity staffing company. And so doctors are victims here too, but really it's about the patient. And your experience is very common. I have heard from so many people. The quality of care is just one part of the equation here. There's another frightening aspect, the medical bills. So one of the key aspects of private equity in healthcare that really, really sort of um, educated a lot of people was the surprise medical bills. It was so outrageous that our dysfunctional Congress actually did something about it. What it was, was if you went to the emergency department in your town, you go there, you, you think because it's your hospital in your town, you think it's going to be covered by your insurance where you've been before, you know, with that hospital. What a private equity staffing company figured out how to do was to carve out from the insurance coverage the emergency department. So the emergency department was no longer included in the coverage of the hospital. It was a separate entity um, run by separate doctors, and so they could bill additionally. And people started having these thousands of dollars of bills. And it was all because of this money grab that had been devised by a private equity company. And it was fascinating because, first of all, uh, it took Yale University, a major study by them to identify it. But then when it came time for Congress to act, you actually had people on both sides of the aisle so outraged by this practice. Everyone was so outraged that they said, okay, this has got to stop. And they did curb it. But that is what we're talking about. That's what happens when private equity is involved in healthcare. It's all about the money. Get that money, as Alison Brown was told. When we come back, why your doctor might hand their practice over to private equity in the first place. This podcast is brought to you by Progressive Insurance. Whether you're driving, cooking, or doing laundry, Progressive knows the podcasts you listen to go best when they're bundled with another activity. Much like how their progressive home and auto policies go best when they're bundled. Having these two policies together makes taking care of your insurance easier, and it could help you save too. Customers who save by switching their home and car insurance to Progressive save nearly $800 on average. That's a whole lot of savings and protection for your favorite podcast listening activities, like going on a road trip, cooking dinner, even hitting the home gym. Yep, your home and your car are even easier to protect when you bundle your insurance together. Find your perfect combo. Get a home and car insurance quote at progressive.com today. 
Progressive Casualty Insurance Company and Affiliates. National average 12-month savings of $793 by new customers surveyed who save with Progressive between June 2021 and May 2022. Potential savings will vary. First, the bad news. SAP Business AI won't help you generate cubist versions of your family's holiday photos, but it will help you understand which supplier is best to help you roll out your plant-based packaging in Southeast Asia. Identify the training your junior project manager needs to rise up the ranks and automate repetitive tasks while you focus on big innovations so you can be ready for the next opportunity. Revolutionary technology, real world results. That's SAP Business AI. Apple Card is the perfect cash back rewards credit card. You earn up to 3% daily cash on every purchase every day. That's 3% on your favorite products at Apple, 2% on all other Apple Card with Apple Pay purchases, and 1% on anything you buy with your titanium Apple Card or virtual card number. Visit apple.co slash card calculator to see how much you can earn. Apple Card issued by Goldman Sachs Bank, USA, Salt Lake City branch. Subject to credit approval. Terms apply. So, I mean... It's all about the money. I'm assuming, I mean, doctors don't become doctors because of money alone. I mean, why are these private practices um, and hospitals, why are they choosing to sell to private equity? Well, there are basically two questions. One is why would a physician practice sell to private equity? And that's kind of a simple answer. And that is often these um, practices have been around for a long time. The physician who runs it and owns it <clears throat> is an older person looking to retire, you know, or is ready to move on, okay? But, you know, what happens is the people who are left behind, like the Allison Browns of the world, younger physicians who now have to deal with this, they're the ones who are really being victimized by it. So a lot of doctors sell out because they think that this is, you know, their payday for, and I'm not saying they're greedy, but just their payment for establishing this practice and doing a good job over these all these years. So one thing I've read is that one of the reasons doctors wind up selling to private equity is because they're sort of fed up with managing insurance administration in their practices, that it's become so onerous and they just want to get that off their hands. And private equity is one of their, their selling points is, you know, we can take that off your hands. Is that right? Yeah, no, you see this constantly. Um, people that I've spoken to, the doctors say, yes, they came in and they said to us, uh, we can handle all your back office, all your administrative duties, um, no problem at all. And, you know, you'll just be free to talk with your patients. You'll be hands free, not hands tied by doing all the administrative work. And so that's a that's a key reason why uh, there is a huge problem with doctor burnout right now, um, where they're you know forced to do insurance uh, approvals and they're dealing with denials, and you know it's it's really a tough road to hoe. It's uh, certainly not glamorous, and these guys and gals did not go into this, you know, to be administrators. They went into this to help people. So Gretchen, I mean, consolidation's been going on in the healthcare industry for a while. Outside of private equity, there are these like big hospital groups buying up more and more practices. Would some of this be going on no matter who was running these hospitals? I have a, a doctor group where I live too that's owned by a big healthcare company. Um, and their service is, you know, it's not great. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not surprised. You know, healthcare in the United States is broken. It is so broken, and we spend 18% of gross domestic product on healthcare, which is double the next uh, largest outlay by a developed country, okay? Yet we pay enormously for it, and we get um, less than terrific care. So w there is a lot wrong with healthcare. The insurance companies are far too powerful, obviously. Um, they call the shots on denials of care on, you know, what you have to do, tests that you can or cannot have. That's a huge problem in healthcare, of course. 
Um, and so there's a lot wrong with healthcare. Private equity just happens to be one sort of piece of the puzzle. Um, but I think it's an important piece because it is just, it really is capitalism on steroids. And you just, people need to know what's going on, but it is extremely stealthy because when you go into your emergency department, it doesn't say at the top of the building sign, the KKR emergency department. You don't know these things are even owned and operated by these, you know, extremely aggressive financiers. Yeah. So you said, I mean, private equity is private. It's hard to to know exactly what's going on. It's hard to know if a PE firm, you know, owns the practice you're going to. Um, and also private equity firms, they don't always just buy a practice outright. Sometimes they have partial ownership. You talked about, you know, staffing the emergency room. Um, what are some of the, the ways PE gets involved um, without, you know, fully owning a practice. Um, and does that make it, does that make it harder just the way private equity operates? Does it make it that much harder to sort of figure out what's going on? Very difficult. Um, so I'm a longtime financial reporter and even I have difficulty sometimes piecing this stuff together. For instance, if you look at a hospital, you can't tell, does private equity run the emergency department? You know, one of the ways that I have uh, tried to figure that out is by going on the private equity owned staffing company's websites and looking for job listings oh, <laughs> in particular <laughs> hospitals. So, I mean, it really is like you you need to have a Sherlock Holmes to find these things. But um, it's, it's important, for instance, 65% of physician practice buyouts in the past five years have been private equity companies. So we're talking about a big piece of the action here. I mean, healthcare s strikes me as a sector that, I mean, I thought was fairly closely regulated. I mean, there's so much federal money at stake here through through Medicare. Are these firms being closely watched by regular regulators? You know, there are very few, kind of surprisingly few kind of rules of the road or rules or regulations about, for instance, staffing or how a uh, healthcare entity operates. For instance, California is the only state in the union that has pretty strict laws about patient nurse ratios in the hospital, in the ICU. I mean, Massachusetts has a, a law that does talk about that, but you know, all the other states basically it's up to the operator of the hospital. And there are laws against the corporate practice of medicine that came about because lawmakers realized that pitting a patient against the profit orientation of a for-profit entity was problematic or could be problematic. And so laws on more than 30 states in the country do exist barring the corporate practice of medicine. But no one is enforcing these laws. No one goes after these things. Regulators and lawmakers are taking some baby steps. At the end of last year, two senators launched a bipartisan investigation into private equity and healthcare. The Federal Trade Commission also recently took the unusual step of suing a private equity backed anesthesia group in Texas for driving up prices. Then, earlier this month, three federal agencies, the FTC, along with the Department of Justice and the Department of Health and Human Services, announced they're seeking public input as they look into the impact of private equity in healthcare. So we have these agencies, we have the senators who launched an investigation last year. You have a sense that the needle's kind of moving in the direction of cracking down here? Well, I would say yes. Uh, certainly, um, these actions are very encouraging. Um, it does indicate that they're at least this, these activities are on the radar screen. Um, but, you know, saying you're going to launch an investigation and actually bringing an investigation um, are two different things. So I am from the show me state. I'm going to wait and watch <laughs> and hope that something will come of this. Certainly, patients need to have actions taken to protect them because 
And there's really very little protection out there. What will it mean? What could it mean for the future of healthcare in the U.S. if private equity keeps up this pace? I think it's going to just become more of a profit center. And you're just going to see a continuation of what we've already seen, which is a decline in patient care um, and an increase in a very small slice of the population, an increase in the money and profits that they're making. It doesn't really matter, you know, that my fast food operation that I go to in the morning to buy my coffee and my donut is private equity owned, okay? I mean, if I don't like the coffee and if, if the donut gets smaller and smaller, I can go somewhere else. But your your emergency department, your dermatologist, I mean, these are life and death things. Gretchen, thank you so much for talking to me. I am delighted anytime, Emily. Gretchen Morganson is a senior financial reporter at NBC News. You can find her reporting at NBCNews.com. She's also the author of These Are the Plunderers, How Private Equity Runs and Wrecks America. And that's it for our show today. What Next TBD is produced by Evan Campbell, Anna Phillips, and Patrick Ford. Our show is edited by Mia Armstrong-Lopez. Alicia Montgomery is vice president of audio for Slate. TBD is part of the larger What Next family. TBD is also part of Future Tense, a partnership of Slate, Arizona State University, and New America. If you're a fan of the show, I have a request for you. Become a Slate Plus member. Just head on over to slate.com slash whatnextplus to sign up. And we'll be back next week with another episode. I'm Emily Peck, filling in for Lizzie O'Leary, and you can catch me over on Slate Money every Saturday. Thanks for listening. For the ones who work hard to ensure their crew can always go the extra mile. And the ones who get in early so everyone can go home on time. There's Grainger. Offering professional-grade supplies backed by product experts so you can quickly and easily find what you need. Plus, you can count on access to a committed team ready to go the extra mile for you. Call, click Grainger.com, or just stop by. Grainger. For the ones who get it done.